My name is Danny Gonzalez. I'm co-founder of Perception. And I'm Jeremy Lasky, the other co-founder of Perception. I just wanted to find out, find out more about Perception and how you came about creating it. Mm -hmm. Uh, so the story of how perception started, basically, um, we can go all the way back to, uh, the days where Danny and I met working at R. Greenberg Associates or RGA, uh, which I'm sure many of your listeners have, have heard of. Yeah. Uh, but when Danny and I were there, it was a much different, uh, design studio. It was about 120 people. Um, it was a, uh, a legendary studio in New York and really on the whole East coast for visual effects or movies and specifically film title sequences. Our Greenberg Associates has done some of the most legendary and iconic film title sequences of the last 40 plus years, um, including Superman in 1978 with Christopher Reeve and Aliens and Untouchables and Seven and, and so many others. Um, so Danny and I were there for between five and six years each, uh, mainly working on a lot of uh, commercial work, but some film title work and some feature film work too. Danny was in the visual effects department. I was in the design department. We collaborated on a lot of these projects together because at the time, uh, VFX and design were, were pretty much uh, like tag team partners on a lot of the work. Mm -hmm. um, but the story of RGA kind of shifted in 2000 where they went all digital. They uh, decided to stop doing any work for movies and, and television. Um, they went fully into uh, the web. Uh, at the internet, which was obviously exploding in 2000, especially in New York, yeah. the dot com and dot bomb uh, tidal wave was just beginning to build. Yeah. And RGA uh, saw that and decided they wanted to get right onto that uh, yeah. that wave. And they were very successful at it. And today, you know, there are thousands of people in offices around the world doing digital work uh, for some of the biggest brands uh, there is. But Danny and I left in 2000. Um, I took. Uh, I took some, some freelance uh, work on. I got to work at a, a couple of other agencies, but I always wanted to start my own thing. And Danny was kind of finishing up at RGA as well. And I convinced him to to come uh, come with me and let's start something together. Uh, we had a lot of the uh, skill sets we, we needed to, to make this work. Um, you know, him being in the effects world and me more design was a very, uh, very yin and yang type of partnership. So we felt like we could really, you know, be a great, great team. Mm -hmm. um, and technology at that time was really becoming um, so much more powerful uh, than when we had started at RGA, when the only way to do the work we were doing was to do it on very high end and very expensive machines and these, these digital suites that ad agencies would rent for crazy money. But in 2000, you know, we were starting to play around with uh, Final Cut Pro and digital video and after Effects was getting much more powerful. So we realized that we could start doing this work with just a couple of Macs and, and a few pieces of software and a lot of the skills and uh, tips and tricks that we had developed uh, at RGA. Um, and we found the perception in the fall of 2001. I'll let you take it from there. It's only the very beginning of the story. And yeah, then. sure. Yeah. So uh, like Jeremy said, uh, perception was founded in 2001. Um, Primarily all, you know, we call each other the grandfathers of the desktop revolution. <laughs> um, you know, there were a bunch of other companies that did it uh, as well. But uh, a lot of it was, uh, I guess, re-educating the clients that were used to going to the studios like RGA yeah. um, and, and kind of retraining their brain to come to studios like us where it was uh, a little bit more cost effective. Um, but the thing that um, that we were known for was our 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 creativity and our speed in coming up with that uh, creativity. Um, and that's something I think uh, still sticks today, you know, where we're just as fast. Um, luckily we have a little bit more time, you know, Jeremy and I were doing projects, we'd have to figure out, you know, what the design looked like by the end of Monday because Friday was due when we were doing that constantly for a number of years. Um, but little by little, we, you know, we got clients that were, you know, uh, that got, that were bigger projects and you know we had a little bit more time frame to think about creative and, and things like that mm -hmm. um so i would i guess I'll, I'll jump towards 
uh, a milestone for uh, perception is 2009 when we had the opportunity to work on Iron Man 2. Yeah. Now, from 2001 to 2009, we worked with some great clients, ESPN and all their, you know, brands, ESPN2, um, ESPN Deportes, all that stuff. Classic. Classic. Um, and, and then we worked with HBO and the work that we did for HBO, you know, caught the eye of people at Showtime. And a lot of these people also move from place to place. So, you know, they'd be at HBO and then we'd go to Showtime and then hire us. Um, we did a lot of sports, which was probably just because we were sports fans. All right. Um, and of course, we were working on a lot of ESPN. Um, and then we worked a lot with the advertising agency. So that world was similar to what we were doing at RGA. Um, you know, we did a lot of, uh, a couple of network rebrands and things like that. Um, but then again, moving closer and closer to 2009, we always kept like this hit list of clients that we wanted to work with and Marvel was at the top of that list. Yeah. Um, so we just made it a, uh, made a commitment and, and made a decision that we're going to attack pretty hard. Um, and we did. And finally, and it's kind of a whole other story, which will take up this whole podcast if I get too deep into it, but yeah, sure. To give you the the kind of the, the higher level uh, story is, um, you know, we, we hit them. They gave us an opportunity. Uh, we showed them some work. Um, they asked us to do some of the work in their um, animation division where we did actually do uh, title sequences. And they took them just as serious as the films that they do today back then. And, um, and the first one we got to work on was Hulk versus Wolverine. And the crazy thing about that is my favorite – a Marvel character is uh, Wolverine and Jeremy's yeah. favorite is Hulk. So right. the fact that our first project with Marvel was that it was like, wait, are we paying you guys? Or are you paying us to work yeah. on this? Right. It was Destiny. Yeah. It was Destiny yeah. yeah. So, um, so then again, fast forward, you know, those people were the, the folks that we work with currently. Um, some of them are at Marvel studios still. So they remembered us uh, for this Iron Man two project and they brought us in. And there was a phone call that we had and we had our designs up on, you know, we we're sharing a screen and he said, yeah, we're going to go with this one for the big screen behind Robert when he lands. But this one really is interesting because it looks like something that could be uh, uh, like a, uh, a sample for what his phone could look like. Um, and our ears kind of perked up and we're like, whoa, wait, what was that all about? You know, so um, we decided after we did the work that they asked us to do to, to do a test over a weekend and send it to them of what we thought. Tony Stark's phone should look like. Mm -hmm. And um, it's currently on our site. You can go to the case study. The case study is very uh, rich in uh, content. Yeah. But um, we basically did the test, got word back from them. They loved it. And we ended up designing over, well, all of Tony Stark's tech. Mm -hmm. I can't remember how many shots. But um, so then fast forward to today. And that's the, the kind of the world we play in or the world that uh, the perception uh, realm is we do all the science fiction tech for the Marvel films and other films, but most of the Marvel films. Um, and then on the other side, we do the science fact work, which is the real technology work we do. Yeah. Um, of course, there's always that design aspect of it to make it look as cool as possible or as if Tony Stark or someone from Tony's um, uh, elk designed it. Um, but that's where we are today. Right. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Uh, yes. Yeah, that's an amazing, amazing journey. Um, I'm just wondering, um, what triggered the, the decision to, to differentiate your studio from being a fully VFX focused company? So why we're not only VFX? Yeah. What, what, yeah. What, what made you decide? I to think, do? um, you know, we, we could never, we never could and never wanted to compete, you know, with, right. with ILM and, and digital domain and, you know, some of these legendary uh, VFX studios, uh, you know, in, in sheer, you know, manpower and horsepower, like we could never even come close to that. And that's really not something that we were ever, you know, attempting to do. You know, the Iron Man 2 work was, uh, was really more of a design challenge. Uh, at least that's how we, you know, initially saw it of what would Tony Stark's phone look like, what would his you know, coffee table look like, and so forth. Um, it became a VFX job when we had to take all these designs and put them into the scenes and comp them seamlessly and believably. Um, and that just really was the springboard to all the future, you know, future film work uh, that came after it. 
Um, and some of it uh, was more VFX heavy than others. You know, some of our, our feature film work uh, is more on the conceptual level where we're just kind of coming up with ideas and, um, and uh, technologies to help support the story and the characters and just kind of helping, this, helping Marvel and their filmmakers and writers solve a challenge or a problem that they can't seem to figure out in a, in a scene or uh, with, with a character. How can we visualize something that they're ha having trouble, you know, figuring out how to visualize. Yeah. So I think that's really where we, you know, where we shine is, um, you know, cracking those nuts. Yeah. Um, and, you know, when we get to do the, the VFX compositing and actually put it in the scene, it's almost a bonus. You know, it, it's not always, uh, it's not always part of a, our, our, uh, I guess our scope. Right. Um, we're more often tapped for for the design uh, and the you know the thought process behind some of this some of this VFX work that that you see. You know, another great example is um, the opening prologue to Black Panther, um, which was uh, beautifully executed uh, by another vendor, mm -hmm. uh, but Perception was actually responsible for mapping that out and kind of figuring out the story of Vibranium. It's the opening of the movie where I think the voiceover is Baba tell me a story yep. and the meteor, you know, lands of vibranium and, you know, Wakanda, you know, you, the rest is history. So we sort of mapped that out. We did a very rough uh, pre-visualization of it. I think we had some hand sketches, some quick wireframes and stuff like that. But then we handed that over to another VFX studio. Uh, it just did a beautiful job and it, it's fine. Cause you know, that's just not, you know, a three minute, mm -hmm. A uh, full uh, photo reel VFX with sand. Yeah. It's probably not, you know, we're probably not the, the place to, to be doing that. Right. We can do little pieces of that as we did in the closing titles. Yeah. But, you know, that's a pretty serious uh, VFX piece. Yeah, of course. Yeah, I think there's a, there's an expertise and it goes back to what Jeremy said about um, the, the Iron Man 2 being a design challenge that we, we just didn't come up with cool stuff. We came up with stuff or designs that had meaning and that would help help tell more of the story than just tony doing his thing it was it was as if tony designed it you know and if you you know kind of, if you take all the designs we did for all the different characters of the marvel universe you can almost look at that graphic and say that's shield that's tony yeah. that's you know black panther that's whatever thor's you know cool stuff yeah. or thor's girlfriend i should say because she has a lot of the technology so you know we tried to create uh kind of like a personality within this realm or within that character's personality that our graphics and our uis would match to mm -hmm. and i think that's something that marvel appreciates in what we bring and that's why they sometimes bring us in you know like they did with black panther and a couple other films before they even shoot it they're like hey we got to figure out this whole world and what does it look like and you know help us kind of add to the story you know i mean they they're amazing storytellers and the directors are great and the whole marvel team is phenomenal but you know they, they kind of look to us to kind of add that little bit of extra you know um what we call moments of the light you know or just that extra bit of storytelling that adds that layer of you know chocolate fudge and sprinkles on top that make it delicious yeah um so so that's kind of where you know these technology companies see that and they're like, well, there's actually some thought in that, you know, that would work like that in the future. And again, that's kind of how one goes into the other and then that one comes back and feeds the other and it's an infinite loop of each one feeding each other. Um, and that's really, I mean, now we say that's what we do, but back then we kind of didn't know it, but we organically started to build that infinite loop. Mm -hmm. It just took a little bit of time and now it's like, it's the perfect, Course, yeah. you know yeah sure do you think developing like technology first in 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 fiction like fi fictional um visual visually do you think that helps um with potential ethical concerns with new innovations i think you know one of the things that we do is is what we call science fiction prototyping mm -hmm. which is you know taking an idea for a new technology or a new user experience and putting it into a uh, a science fiction scene or a, a, a fictional scene mm -hmm. um, that could be like a mini movie. Um, and that's a great way to test out technologies without actually, you know, making them. Mm -hmm. So oftentimes we'll, we'll be hired to 
kind of visualize what a futuristic tech application or product might be and how would it be used in a, uh, in a quote, real world situation or use case with different personas or characters. So we'll, we'll actually create a, a mini movie with this technology kind of comped in as a visual effect, mm -hmm. showing how people might be using this product and how it might work. What are its shortcomings? Where does it um, need to be improved? Uh, and it's, it's kind of like a, a little bit of a testing lab um, that technology companies can use uh, doing this kind of visualization and prototyping without actually having to build it and put it out in the world uh, before it's ready. Um, so, you know, I think movies and, and television have been doing that for a long time, right? Everybody knows the Star Trek communicator device was an influential piece of design for Motorola's flip phone, mm -hmm. right? Looks exactly the same. So it, you know, it's, um, it has a cool form factor, but what really was, uh, was inspiring about it was it showed the utility of a, of a product like that and how it could be useful to people, you know, just by seeing these characters using it in, in, in the ways that they used it. Yeah. So I think that was your question. Um, hopefully uh, that kind of covers it. Yeah, sure, yeah. Yeah, do you think having too much freedom can be a negative thing as? Creative freedom? Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I always say it's always good to have some limits and some, some boxes to, to paint within. Uh, you know, the artist usually gets completely terrified and overwhelmed by a blank canvas, mm -hmm. just wide open space, like just make something nice. Like that's, mm -hmm. I can't, like it's, it's almost paralyzing to some uh, creatives. Uh, me being one of them, I really like having a, having a set of parameters and, and limits that we have to work within and try to solve because um, it gives you some kind of uh, uh, something to kind of shoot for, you know, and know when you've, you've successfully solved it. If it's just, you know, blank, wide open canvas with total freedom, you don't really know. It's nothing really to, to measure your success with it. You know, then that's just pure art, which which is great. That there's a obviously a, a huge place for that, but you know the work we do has to have a has to have a purpose and a function, whether it's serving a scene in a movie or or serving a technology client as a piece of user experience design. Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Are Are you able to maybe share any in house technologies that maybe perception has has created that gives you an edge of our competitors? I think the ultimate edge is, I mean, obviously, the, you know, the team, um, uh, I guess the, the, there's no specific technology. We don't have anything magical here. Um, that, that we could talk about. That, well, yeah, that we could talk about. If I, if I mention anything, there's going to be like a spear that comes in or like I'll get like pulled out and like, oh, no, I can't. But no, there's nothing magical. You know, we, we use a, a lot of the similar tools that everybody uh, in the industry uses, you know, Cinema 4D, mm -hmm. um, the Adobe Creative Suite, Houdini, yeah. um, new, you know, all that fun stuff. But I think it just comes down to, um, you know, team and getting the right new people for the team that add something that perhaps maybe the, the team was, you know, missing. Um, I think it starts with, you know, the right culture also, you know, um, but one of the things I always joke about that I always, you know, or people make fun of me about is like, you know, uh, separately, we all have our own superheroes, but to get, uh, we have our own superpowers, but together we're like the Avengers and we can't be stopped, right. you know, but if I'm by myself, I might run into a little bit of trouble with something, but you know, if I had my team behind me, it's like, it, there's nothing we can't, yeah, we can't get done. So I think there's a lot of variables like, you know, just mindset and again, just not being afraid to, uh, to fail. And, and, you know, fail fast and then recover and come up with the right solution. Yeah, yeah sure. How, how, do you, how difficult do you think um, every piece of HED or user interface remains un unique and unrecycled? Because you guys are usually always jumping on project to project and always having to innovate and come up with new, new ideas and new solutions. How do you make sure you're, you're not... Replicate yeah, stay fresh. Yeah. 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 Um, I think that's also a combination of being able to work in the tech world and the film world, because we, we learn a lot from the people on the tech side. Yeah. 
of perhaps futuristic technologies that I can't or mm -hmm. can talk about. Um, and we kind of bring that into the to the world when we're working on a, on a film project. And usually it's obviously the technology. When we're doing the title sequences, that's a whole different ballgame. But um, it's it's just a great two, two realms to play in because, again, one feeds the other. And we have, you know, uh, professors from like – MIT or, or uh, Tech. Georgia Tech what, that we're talking to about, hey, we're working on this crazy thing for this, this, and this, mm -hmm. and it's used for this. And then we'll sit there and say, well, actually, you could use that for this, this, and this. And that's a cool technology for the next X movie of this. Mm -hmm. um, and then that kind of like feeds each other. And then we'll do that. And then someone in the technology world will see and be like, hey, you guys were working on this thing. And we're actually working on something like that because we heard that. Georgia Tech has something in the works that might be, you know, uh, working in two years mm -hmm. in that realm. Mm -hmm. And again, it's just a constant, you know, so I think that helps, you know, again, you know, um, uh, as far as staying fresh, again, it, it's having the right team, mm -hmm. um, challenging each other. You know, if we see something that's like, eh, that's kind of like seen it before, mm -hmm. I think we got to try something else. And our clients are very savvy. They're going to look at something and be like, yeah, we already, yeah, we did that. we got to do something different. Mm -hmm. So, Yeah, sure, yeah. Do, do, you, do you see the need to extend your offices across to, to Europe? Because usually or the, the, there's quite a, a lot of studios from Europe coming into to America or Canada and just uh, have... Yeah, have yeah. Them, unless, yeah. I can, unless we can open up a studio that's right on the beach <laughs> in like uh, Ixtapa. Or, uh, or oh, that's not even Europe. Sorry, um, I don't know. Somewhere in Spain, like yeah, I'm, I'm all there, Just hanging out on the beach, doing work with like a nice drink on the side would be great. Right. But um, Ibiza, Ibiza. That's what I was thinking of. Yeah. Ibiza. Thank you. Um, but no, I mean, I think, um, I mean, I, I'd never say never. You know, possibly. But for right now, I think um, we like to manage it. You know, from here. Mm. Um, a lot of our clients just, I mean, now with the, the way the internet is and stuff, we barely have to get on a plane. It's crazy. Of course, yeah. You know? Yeah. And, you know, the one positive thing I could say about the whole pandemic was people adapted and, you know, we could work from home mm -hmm. or, or I should say, you know, they could work from home because we're in the studio now. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, thankfully. But, uh, but even before that, I mean, we rarely had clients that were coming to the office. A lot of it's, you know, obviously the studios are in LA or in Atlanta or wherever they, you know, might be in London. Um, we, you know, we didn't have to fly there. In the old days, when we first started, we were on a lot of planes, a Every lot of flights. Week. Yeah, it was, it was, we had a lot Rolling. of mileage. Yeah, Rolling. Very tiring. But now it seems like it's, it's not, it's not uh, necessary. Yeah, sure. Okay. Amazing. As two people that have been both artists um, at other studios as well as being founders of, of, of a big studio right now, are you? do you recall any of the worst maybe business or career mistakes or decisions that you've made? And what advice would you give to other people like maybe potentially trying to follow your your footsteps as either either as artists or people trying to to start a company like yours I, you know we've made every mistake you can make that's the whole point of of uh of running a business you're not going to get it right the first time um if you do it's probably more uh, uh luck than skill um we've we've uh, we, we've tried everything we've made a million mistakes and the most important thing that i would say is you want to make sure that you learn from all of them so Hopefully you don't repeat them, um, you know, and then what happens is the longer you're doing it, running a business, that is, the more you begin to recognize uh, patterns, patterns in people, patterns in clients, patterns in projects, and you've seen these patterns before and you're able to, uh, to anticipate where something might be headed. Uh, if it's heading in the wrong direction, you kind of see it before it happens and you can make the necessary uh, decisions and adjustments to prevent prevent disaster. Um, so, you know, we're not afraid of making mistakes. I think, uh, I think you know, a lot of new business owners uh, suffer from uh, 
uh, analysis uh, by uh, paralysis by analysis, I think the saying is, where just overanalyze everything and it kind of prevents you from making decisions. And um, when you don't make a decision, that's that's worse than making a bad decision. So I'd rather make a, a bad decision than no decision at all. Mm-hmm. Um, because if you make a bad one, you can at least then fix it with another decision. Um, yeah, I think uh, there, there's just, you know, too many mistakes to, to pick out any one individual mistake. Yeah, I mean, as far as advice goes, I would say that, you know, pick a company or a person that you you kind of want to follow mm-hmm. and see what kind of steps they took. Um, you know, we try to advise everybody that is in our company of the different um, pitfalls of what could happen. Mm-hmm. Sometimes they listen, sometimes they don't. But again, it just it just comes from being in the business for so long mm-hmm. um, and recognizing the patterns that Jeremy mentioned. Mm-hmm. Um, but... You know, I mean, the, the old oldest cliche in the book is like, you know, just never stop trying. And if if, uh, if, if people tell you you're crazy because you want to open up your own company, I kind of tell people you're crazy if you don't. Mm-hmm. So, you know, you, sure. you have, uh, it, it's not easy. I mean, you know, before this, uh, when we first started this company, I had a full head of hair and now it's, <laughs> it's almost all gone. So, um, you know, it's not going to be an easy, an easy task, but if you have passion for it and you want to, you want to do it then you know you might as well do you might as well go bold loving what you do i would also say that you know there's uh there's no timing it right you know a lot of people are waiting to time these things time the market time the economy this isn't a good time it's uh you know it's a pandemic it's um it's a recession we've we've we started perception literally less than two months after 9 11. And in New York, that's about as bad as it could ever be. It was, it was, you know, it was horrible, um, and everything was uh, was shut down, and markets were closed, and the economy was in a tailspin. Uh, but you know, we were um, we were committed, and uh, there was no real turning back at that point. Once you make that decision, you kind of get a lot of momentum, a fo- forward momentum, and you just continue it. And you know, honestly, the two of us back then. Uh, we're, we're, we're relentless, right. you know, just completely relentless. There was just no, uh, I mean, I was a maniac personally. <laughs> uh, a lot I of look, energy. Drinks. I look back right. on it and I'm like, man, I was, I was complete. I was over my, out of my mind, obsessed to this day. Still <laughs> keeps, um, it, keeps it going. Yeah. You know, I just, uh, this was it for me. Like I, I had, I was giving it everything I got, you know, yeah, to make this work. Um, and, and Danny in this, in the same, uh, in the same mindset. Um, but we weathered a lot of storms and that's inevitable too. Obviously, the longer you're in existence, the more cycles you're going to see highs and lows. Yeah. We never thought of, you know, who, who would have predicted a global pandemic for two years? Of course. Yeah. No one, no one saw that coming. And, you know, initially we were both scared of that too. When, when we had to go home and figure that out, yeah. we did like the rest of the world. We got through it, but you know there were other pretty low periods, and you know it's uh, it's part of the it's part of the journey. It's going to be a roller coaster, um, and you just got to realize that you know every bottom, every every market bottom is followed by uh, you know a, a new move up yeah, off the bottom. So yeah, it's a cycle. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, it's great. Great. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, just to, just to finish it off, I'm just wondering what your aspirations for perception are in the, in the next few decades. Um, open up that studio on the beach in Ibiza. That's number one, because <laughs> you just reminded me. Um, you know, it's tough to say, you know, if you talk to me today, it's just building the current team and getting things, you know, uh, going for more projects that are coming in. You know, in, in the next two years, obviously, again, growing the team and, and getting more work in, you know, trying to do more work uh, on the tech side, because that's, it's a lot of fun. Unfortunately, it's very hard to showcase it because the stuff we're working on is, you know, coming out two to five years from now. So mm-hmm. it's, it's hard to say what we're working on and, 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 and show it. Yeah. Um, obviously, the Marvel projects are great, you know, they are they're very um, uh, hardcore and they're time consuming and they're, and, and they're very intense, but 
you know, it doesn't matter how burnt out you are after you finish that project, you go to the film and you see your name and the title and your work on a huge screen. Yeah. It's better. It's better than any energy drink you can drink. It's better than this. It's better than anything. It gives you just such a, like a, an adrenaline uh, rush that you just ready. Like yeah. next day, give me another one. Yep. Yeah. I think another thing that, you know, we're both excited about is, is, uh, is a constant, um, a constant like flow of new people and new talent that comes into perception and, you know, re-energizes us both. Uh, we just have a bunch of new, uh, new team members join the company in the last few months, uh, that we're both, you know, really excited about. And that's a nice shot of, of rockstar, uh, you know, into the soul of the company. And, uh, you know, we love that. We're, we're definitely looking to build the team. So anyone listening who's interested in, is talented and, and is passionate about the work that we do and would like to get involved, please uh, send your uh, portfolio, your reel, your resume to uh, careers at experienceperception.com. That yeah. goes right to Danny and myself because yeah. um, we just we just want to continue to build the dream team. Yeah, sure. Yeah. The other email they could send it to is danny at ibiza.com. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's it. Come in soon. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, amazing. I'm, I'm, I'm very grateful for, for your time and, um, yeah. Sure. Thank you. So Thanks for having us. Thank you so much. Yeah, this was great. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thank you.